Uh, welcome, everybody. My, my name is Ruben Zayotti. I'm the director of the, European, the Jean Monnet European Union Center of Excellence. The center is one of the sponsors of this event, together with the McKechnie Institute and the Center for the Study of, um, of um, uh, Security and Development. And uh, we are really uh, honored to have three um, uh, exceptional speakers to um, have a discussion with, with you today about EU-Canada relations. So the way it's going to play out uh, this event is that I'm going to leave the floor for a few minutes each of the ambassadors to present um, uh, some thoughts about uh, this relationship, in particular with, uh, uh, with an emphasis on the, their position in um, countries uh, you know, within Europe. Um, um, and then we're going to open up the discussion to the public. So most of this event is about that, about in engaging, interacting with you. So please feel free to ask questions and engage the ambassadors. I just want to mention the fact that this event is, uh, is streamed online, so there are people who are following uh, the discussion today um, at home or, some, or around, around the world for that matter. And um, so at the end, when you will ask you to um, come forward to ask questions, we're going to have a microphone so that the people at home as well can hear what you have to say. So without much further ado, what I'm going to do, be doing is introducing each of the speakers uh, for today individually. They're going to be presenting, um, um, uh, presenting and then uh, moving on to the Q&A session. I want to start with uh, Honorable Stefan Dion, uh, which a lot of you know is the ambassador to Germany, the special envoy to the European Union and Europe. Prior to his appointment, uh, Mr. Dion was Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs from November 2015 until January 2017, where he championed Canadian leadership in the world on crucial global interests, including the promotion of universal human rights, peace and stability efforts, the global climate challenge, and Canada's commitment to multilateralism. He was previously Minister of the Environment from 2004 to 2005, uh, in 2005, he chaired the United Nations Conference on Climate Change. Um, Mr. Dion was elected as leader of the Liberal Party of Canada and became leader of the official opposition in the Canadian House of Commons, a position which he retained until 2008. Mr. Dion served as Member of Parliament first in 1996 and was re-elected seven consecu consecutive times. Before entering politics, um, Mr. Dion taught political science at the University of Moncton in 1994, then the University of Montreal from 19, 1984 to 1995. He has authored many scientific articles and books on public administration, organizational studies, political institution, and environmental policies. So, please. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be with you today uh, with uh, Dan Costello, our ambassador in the EU and Alex Bukuleskis, our ambassador in Italy. Both of them have much more experience than me in diplomacy, so I'm, I feel well supported. I'm the ambassador in Germany and also Prime Minister Trudeau's special envoy for the EU and Europe. The Prime Minister felt that we needed, at a time where our relationship with the United States is a bit more complicated than usual, uh, we, we needed to strengthen our ability to um, have a strong cohesion in Europe. We have strong missions in each country, but the Prime Minister wanted to develop more kind of U European strategy and he asked me to do so, and it's a pleasure to do it because I am supported by great diplomats in Germany and everywhere in, in Brussels and everywhere in Europe. Uh, today we are part of a, a tour that uh, some key European ambassadors, Canadian European ambassadors, are doing in Canada uh, to convince our business community to take advantage. Sorry to interrupt for a second. Do you mind going to the podium? Just the microphone is a bit strong. Sorry about that. Okay, I thought I was. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's good for the, the here, here is that people at home. At home, okay. We, yes, we. <laughs> So I'm saying that uh, we need to take advantage of CETA, which is the uh, trade agreement that the EU and Canada concluded and which is implemented today. Uh, it's not ratified, but as we speak, there is no tariffs in it. between the EU and Canada, 
percent of the tariffs are gone. And if they charge that to you, it's not supposed to be. Uh, and, and also, all the procurement is open to our industry. So we need to take advantage of all of this. Um, and I must say that we are part of a tour uh, with uh, our, also our colleagues, the ambassador in, uh, in France and in the UK. Uh, myself, I visited uh, Ottawa, uh, Montréal, Quebec, and today um, uh, we are in Halifax. If I compare, I would say that in Halifax, we don't need to convince the people. We, we, we met uh, the, uh, the premier, uh, we met the port, uh, we met the deputy ministers, uh, a lot of business people, and everybody is focusing on, hey, we need to go to Europe, we need to win this market. While in other cities where I went, it was more uh, to convince them that Connecticut is okay, but there are also other markets in the world, and especially the EU. Let me just describe the arguments I, I develop when I want to convince uh, business com the co business community of Canada to have a strong look about the EU market. I'm not telling them go there at any, at any risk. They are in business and they, they need to know what they will doing because if it does not work, we'll not re reimburse them. Um, but we are telling them look this market very, very closely because first, it's a huge market. The EU is 23% of the world economy, 23%. Uh, NAFTA is 27%, so it's almost as big. It's 500 million consumers, 500 million consumers. It's the biggest market on earth for services. 40% of the services that are imported f are from the EU. So that's a very big market. The, uh, the procurement is now open for us. Uh, in theory, I know we have a lot of non-tariff non barriers, but in fact, legally, we have access to this market, or we will. And it's a market of $3.3 trillion. If you want to compare, the U.S. market open to us through NAFTA of, of procurement, public procurement, is $837 billion. So it's more than three times bigger than the U.S. market, the procurement. So we need to, to, to win that. I will tell you that the EU is the first importer of aerospace products, the first importer of oil and gas products, of telecommunications, and I kept this one for the end, of fish and seafood products. The first one. Uh, the second one of automotive goods and medical devices and so on. Now, our trade with the EU is okay, but it's not as great as it should be. We are, last year we exported to the EU, Canada, $41.2 uh, billion, billion, $41.2 in goods and $18 billion in services. It's okay, but I gave you the size of this economy. I think uh, there is a potential to do much more. The US, the U.S. is 415 billion, so it's 10 times smaller than what we are doing in the U.S. It's normal that we are trading more with the U.S. because they are our neighbor and it's so huge economy. But 10 times smaller than the U.S., I think uh, with NAFTA, with CETA, we are on a situation to improve it. 40% um, of our trade of this 41 billion, 40% is with the UK. And part of it is because they have a gold stock exchange and they need our gold. It's good to sell gold, but it's not very difficult if you have a buyer who wants to buy the gold. So if 40% of the is with the UK, that means that the numbers for Italy, uh, for Germany, for France, for Poland, for the Netherlands is even less impressive. I will give you the numbers for Germany since I am the ambassador for Germany. It's $4 billion in goods that we exported last year and $2 billion in services uh, for the fourth economy of the world. That's the equivalent of two days and a half of trade with the U.S. I think we are in situation now 
to do much better than that. Um, with CETA, as I said, uh, tariff elimination, access to public procurement, enhanced labor, labor mobility, streamlined customs and trade facilitation, and clear rules of origin. So it's an opportunity that we need to, to, to take now because the U.S. don't have that. If you sell your lobster to the EU now, the tariffs are gone. But the tariffs still apply for, for Maine. So it's a great opportunity to accustomate the, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, European co consumers to our product. Uh, and also, there is a pipeline of negotiations. The EU wants to negotiate with Japan, the free trade agreement with Australia, with, with the Mercosur, and so on. So in the meantime, we, we have an advantage. We need to, to take advantage of it uh, now. For, for uh, Nova Scotia, uh, export opportunities are obvious. We had very good discussions today. Advanced manufacturing and most agriculture and agri-food and fish and seafood, that's, that's a great opportunity. So I spoke a bit about Germany. Uh, I want my colleagues to have time to fully explain but Germany is a great market. And one of the advantage for us to be winner in this market is that it's a very difficult one. <laughs> it's very demanding for regulations, precision. They are very uh, demanding. They have high standards uh, to, to partner with them, for them to buy your products. And once you have succeeded, you have the best capacity to succeed everywhere in the world will give you confidence that you are able to do it everywhere. If you are able to do it in Germany, the R&D, uh, science and technologies, top in the world. So if you match them to the point that they need you and they accept you in their market, you're en voiture for everywhere in the world. Um, you need to have a strong proposition. If it's half-baked, if yourself, you're not sure of yourself, the Germans will not have any patience for you. You know they never stand up during, in, during an opera? Almost never. They will not do it to be polite. They will applaud. But if they are very enthusiastic, they will, they will stand up. In Montreal, we, we do it in a way. We want to be polite. We want, <laughs> but not in Germany. They are not polite. Uh, they, 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 you need to be persistent and patient. Uh, to visit the market once or two will not be enough. Yes, strict regulatory regime, I said that, consumer concerns about GMOs, about, uh, about uh, pesticides. So to be bio, to, be, to have a high standard will be a great help. But my last point, and uh, you will be convinced of it when you, you will hear Alex and, and Dan, you will not be alone. If you want to succeed in Europe, we have strong embassies, strong consulate, strong diplomacy, strong... Uh, trade commissioners will support you, will help you to find a market, to find, to find a network, to find partners. Can, the Team Canada will be there to succeed in Europe. Europe is waiting for us. Let's go. Thank you, Ambassador Dion, and I will let me introduce uh, um, Ambassador Bugaliskis. In August 2017, uh, Ambassador Bugaliskis was appointed as Canada's ambassador to the Italian Republic, as well as permanent representative to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, the World Food, Food Program, and the International Fund uh, for Agricultural Development with concurrent accreditation as ambassador to the Republic of San Marino. In her last assignment at Global Affairs Canada, uh, uh, Ambassador Bugaliskis was Assistant Deputy Minister for Europe, the Middle East, and the Maghreb, where she was closely engaged in the resettlement of 40,000 Syrian refugees in Canada and authored uh, a 1.6 billion three-year strategy for Iraq and Syria. She was concurrently the ch chief negotiator of the Canada-EU Strategic Partnership Agreement, agreement which was signed in October 2016 and came into provisional application in, on April 1st, 2017. Um, Ambassador Bugaliskis has uh, won numerous awards, uh, including a public service award for her contribution to the uh, resettlement of Syrian refugees, a commendation from the clerk of the Privy Council for her work on the Haiti 
Earthquake, a merit award from the Foreign Minister for her contribution to the Summit of the Americas, America, America, sorry, and was the first recipient of the Canadian Foreign Service Officers of the Year Award in 1990. Thanks a lot, please, Ambassador. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, buongiorno, and uh, bienvenue. Um, when you see, hear a long list like that, all you know is, boy, she's old. Huh? And <laughs> been around for a few years, uh, but it's really nice to see such young faces out there today. Uh, don't mind the older ones as well. It makes me feel comfortable, but uh, if you really want to come and talk to me later about a career and the, in global affairs and international, please, uh, you should really be thinking about it. What a great time to be a student. What a great time to be here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Last time I was here, actually, was for my daughter's graduation. She graduated in Dalhousie in marine biology, and uh, she chose this like you did because of the excellence uh, here and because the world is here. And this is what we've heard so much today from the Premier uh, over at the Port Authority uh, with a couple companies. Uh, with its, uh, we've met with a range of deputy ministers. You really have gone global. There's no doubt about it uh, from the very international student body that you find here and all the other universities. I mean, what a, what a university uh, province we have here. Um, to, of course, uh, the increasing number of cruise ships and other uh, shipping that's coming through, the, the increasing air links uh, to the world and particularly to Europe, uh, this is the place to be. And what we're really proud uh, to have been listening to is really the expertise that is coming here as well, particularly on oceans, and that's where you should be focusing. It doesn't mean that you do that only, uh, but it is amazing what Nova Scotia and the Maritimes is doing with regards to, uh, to uh, biology, uh, marine biology, to oceanography, to innovation, uh, with the new cl super cluster being uh, developed here, uh, to the Cove, to the Bedford Institute. Uh, um, you know, I just want to say congratulations. And I want to talk a little bit, I guess, I mean, Ambassador Dion did it beautifully to talk to you about the importance of the uh, comprehensive economic trade agreement between Canada and the European Union, how much the Maritimes and Nova Scotia will actually benefit, if only to ship all the great goods that are going to be going over there, but also to be part of the exports that will go over to Europe. But it isn't just about trade, it's about a relationship. And I wanted to talk to you about that. You may have heard something about a strategic partnership agreement. Uh, this is what I was involved with a few years back when I was in Ottawa. And that is the political counterpart to the trade agreement. And the, the strategic partnership agreement between Canada and the European Union is about that larger relationship, how we can collaborate and work together even more closely in the areas of uh, innovation, uh, climate change, on international peace and security. You name it, we do it. We have done it, but we need to continue to do that. That because the European Union matters, it's a huge uh, uh, 500 million people, 510 million people uh, with enormous capacity and, and really uh, leveraging their, their weight internationally. And we are really, really key partners. And I think you're part of that story. So why does the trade agreement matter for you? Well, it's really about those partnerships. It's about making jobs. Obviously, we all want to have a job. Um, but it's, it's really, um, as I said, about being able to collaborate. We're in a world right now that's pretty volatile. And if you're, I'm sure you're watching the news every day. And I think those friendships and partnerships are more important than ever. I think there was a feeling at one point that, you know, Europe's kind of old, you know. We know we've got some history there. Um, but in fact, you know, we want to go on to make new relationships. And of course we should be, and we're, you know, we're reaching out to Asia. And again, we we're very taken by how much uh, this uh, region has uh, outreach to, uh, to Asia of late. But, you know, you can never neglect your good friends. And there's a reason why those friendships uh, go back so many decades and in, in hundreds of years. And that's because of the values. It really is the fundamental values of democracy and human rights. It really struck me as ambassador to Italy and previously to Poland to know how many young Canadians lost their lives <clears throat> in Europe. Um, just this past year, I went to Ortona. It will be the 75th anniversary of the Great Battle of Ortona in, in Italy. And up to 6,000 Canadians lost their lives for the liberation of Italy. That's not forgotten at all. I went to the small town of Ortona. The mayor came out. The whole city was out to commemorate the, those sacrifices and the loss not only, of course, of of Canadian soldiers, but of civilians during these, these battles. And that's what we have to build on. And I don't 
always want to be stuck in the past, but I think we have to understand that, that strong foundation that we have moving forward. We have here in Canada 1.5 million um, Canadians of Italian uh, descent and origin. Many of those, those came, came through here, came through Pier 21, came through Halifax on their way to different destinations. Uh, a number of them stayed and settled here too, but obviously the majority are probably in Quebec and, and Ontario. But what a great resource that is as well. Those, are, again, are relationships and partnerships. We have the International Experience Canada. I don't know if anybody knows about the program. Uh, we have it with several... I see a lot of nodding up there. That's great. Um, many, many of our, our countries uh, have a, an exchange program where you can go and uh, travel, work for a while, get to know uh, Europe and vice versa. They can come here to, to Canada. And those friendships and partnerships are really, really key. Uh, we have a very low percentage of Canadians that actually study abroad. And, and I think you should be open to thinking about that. It's really, really important to be able to get some international experience. And I would encourage you. And there's lots of opportunity in Europe. And again, and you have a large, as I said, foreign student body here. Um, so if I go back to the CETA, which I know is supposed to be our main uh, job, um, I, he, the ambassador has already outlined many of the key sectors that uh, I think you will find uh, that will flourish under the CETA, um, and many of them happen to be here. Uh, we've got great opportunity in energy. The, uh, Italy, as well as Europe largely, is looking for uh, less fossil fuels and, and uh, more t technology with regards to climate change. You have great innovation here. We have seafood, of course, uh, which is finding its way to many of the plates, pasta al valungole and uh, all kinds of great pasta dishes that are now using uh, seafood, and I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to market that in a big way. But in the services area, digital, uh, cybersecurity, uh, this is really, really large, and I know, again, you have a lot to offer. Uh, the, as I said be earlier, clean tech technologies are going to really, really benefit. But most importantly, as I said, will be just that upsurge um, of the relationship, a lot more travel in and out of uh, the region in, into Europe, uh, whether it's uh, through flights, uh, through cruises, through student uh, internships. This is so important to that relationship. Um, I think I'll leave it there and have you come and talk to me about why you want to come and work with Global Affairs. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. So, last speaker today is uh, Ambassador Daniel Costello. Um, um, Ambassador Costello taught for uh, several years at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and Université of François Rabelais in Tours, France, before returning to Canada to serve as policy advisor and executive assistant to the Director of Policy Research in the Office of the Prime Minister, 1996-1999. Executive assistant to the uh, to the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, and Chief of Staff uh, to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He returned to teaching at the University of Ottawa in the fall 2004, prior to joining Foreign Affairs Canada in 2005, where he has served as Director General for Intergovernmental Relations and Domestic Outreach, Director General for the European Union and Western Europe, Ambassador to the Republic of Poland, and Director General for Strategic Policy, many other positions that are not going to list, otherwise we're going to take too much time, but uh, thanks a lot, and uh, please, the floor to you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. I, I, I think I have to start. Uh, Stefan mentioned uh, the quality of our diplomats, and I, I, uh, I'm happy to have joined the diplomatic service relatively later than those that, that started uh, as, as young as, as you here. Um, but I, I, I don't know if you know that we have one of, uh, here in your audience, uh, I want to recognize uh, one of our, our great uh, former ambassadors, Glenn Davison. Uh, just so you know, you've got one here, resident, who lives a few blocks away and probably passes through this building a lot. Glenn, uh, there you go. So, we, we stand on the shoulders of our, our formers and we, we love to keep in touch. So look, I don't think I have a lot new to say, but I'm going to reinforce the key point Alex made because I think Stefan has covered uh, a, a lot of the key points about CETA, which is, of course, the reason we're here. But I know you uh, here at the center, you're covering a broad range of issues. And I, I just wanted to underline uh, the importance of Europe uh, to Canada, I think, at this time in particular when... Um, you know, it's, it's easy if you, if you only read the headlines, it's easy to think that with all the crises that Europe's been through over the past few years, I mean, I've been two and a half years in Brussels and I, I you know, I, I saw things really um, 
uh, there was a lot of stress that I arrived the euro in fact many of these are still with us and being managed the eurozone debt crisis the uh, the the uh, shooting war uh, in Ukraine that is uh, still taking such a, a terrible toll the uh, the attacks in the cities uh, including Brussels uh, and, and all that that involved for us the uh, the refugee crisis which really put Europe to the test and is still there's still significant flows um, then brexit uh, and and the rise of angry populism in so many places and uh, and then the election of Donald Trump in the US and what that's meant for reflections on uh, traditional transatlantic relations if you if you look at just the headlines only you'd think wow things are flying apart and and you know Europe uh, may not last well I I'm here to tell you that's not the case I I think Europe has demonstrated remarkable resilience uh, through these crises for, for uh, all kinds of reasons. I'm happy to talk about uh, any of this uh, as we go here today. Um, but I think uh, they've turned now to a, an important reflection on their future that will, is, is forced upon them in many ways because of Brexit and what's coming. And I guess my main point I want to leave you to is that reflection is really important to Canada because for its size, for its reach, for its influence, and for its global role, the EU is a simply indispensable partner for Canada. Um, very briefly, it's a security partner that we, we can't overlook, uh, not just because of the overlapping memberships with NATO, our fundamental security alliance, but for all the work it does in soft security, up what we call higher, higher up security value chains, for conflict prevention work and post-conflict stabilization through the common foreign and security policy that I'm sure many of you here study. Uh, they're very active, and, and that's why we are too, in partnership with them largely in the European neighborhood to try and avoid, frankly, to put it crudely, to avoid another catastrophe like Syria, which has taken such an enormous human toll but is, is, uh, has taken so much time and energy and effort and, and, and cost, opportunity cost, for the kinds when we should be focusing our energy and our efforts and our, our finances in, uh, on, on, on the, the global issues we know we have to address. So preventive security is so much, so much uh, wiser and, and, and more important, but sometimes it doesn't get the attention it should be. And so that partnership, we have been historically since the creation of the Common Foreign and Security Policy, the most engaged external partner on 10 of their 38, I think it is, uh, CSTP missions. And, uh, and that's a, a relationship that continues even today where we're partnered with the EU in several places. Um, the EU also, uh, Alexandra mentioned it well, is, is in this day and age, who's standing up for our shared values, really? Human rights, the rule of law, open societies, open markets. These, as you know, are in question. And it's the Europeans, despite their own internal problems with rule of law and illiberal democracy and the rest, nonetheless, they're, they're moving forward and they're, they're raising this as a standard in their relationships with their partners abroad. And we have a shared interest in seeing those standards uh, upheld and maintained around the world. Um, it's a key diplomatic player. Uh, uh, it believes in multilateral approaches and multilateral solutions because, frankly, there's no alternative to so many of the problems that we're concerned about, from climate action to uh, the sustainable development goals and, 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 and uh, the, the possibility of, of uh, st steering the, the rise of Asia and the rise of Africa and Latin America into the global economy and the rules-based international order um, on, on things like uh, non-proliferation and disarmament. So mentioning just those issues, the Paris Accord, the, the Agenda 2030 SDGs in New York, the Iran nuclear deal, these were achievements of European diplomacy as much as anyone else. These couldn't have been achieved without the EU's push on diplomacy. And that leadership uh, in multilateral avenues uh, is what we're going to need if we're going to solve these problems or, or even begin to address them successfully in days ahead. Our, our top priority in foreign policy, Minister Freeland says, and I, my, my foreign minister, our foreign minister, and I believe her, is to defend and support the rules-based international order. And that's, uh, it, it is under a lot of pressure, as you know, and we need partners to do that. And so right now, a lot of our focus is on trade. We have to make a success of CETA. The reason we're here is to promote it, as, as Stefan said, and, and uh, we're going to keep doing that, and we're really happy to see such successful uptake here in, in Atlantic Canada, Nova Scotia in particular. Um, but it's about the progressive trade agenda we talk about, which is simply the idea that the benefits of trade should be widely shared and that we, in pursuing those benefits of trade, we shouldn't be undermining the high standards that we believe in environmental standards, health and safety standards, consumer standards, labor standards. And that's something we've committed to in CETA. And that's why CETA is more than just a good trade agreement. 
that will bring shared prosperity to Canadians and Europeans. It's, it's kind of a model. It's become a new standard that has changed the debate necessarily when, when the critics of globalization are, are, are on the rise in many places. And, and there are lots of uh, important questions being raised about the, the, the benefits of, of globalization and of openness and of open societies, open markets. Um, we've got to be able to respond to that. And I think CETA is uh, not just an academic paper or, or something that is a discussion point. It's an actual existing treaty that the proof will be in the pudding of the way in which we implement this and make good on those commitments to inclusive growth and to maintaining high standards. So we're committed to that, and we're committed to that in the way we promote it and talk about it. And that's why uh, it's important for our, our shared prosperity. Uh, you heard it earlier. This is the biggest and wealthiest market in the world. Europe is an aging society, it's true, uh, but it's still a fundamentally important partner. 20% uh, of global trade, number one importer of services, and so on and so on. Top public R&D spender, the partnerships. Um, among the things we talked about with the Premier today, what I thought was most interesting is those, those flight connections for collaboration and research and education to bring more Europeans and Canadians right here together uh, and to see what comes of that, which I believe can only be good things. Um, because you know, after, after the U.S., Europe is our number two uh, trade and investment partner, our, our um, uh, number two uh, partner uh, for in, in both directions uh, for, for both trade and investment. And our goal with CETA is to diversify our economic ties and, uh, and to get inside global value chains because we know that the high growth in the years to come is going to be in the developing world in Asia in particular, but uh, Europe is anchored in those global supply chains. And so by getting into, uh, a, a, if you will, a, 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 a business environment that we know better, that is more uh, secure for our SMEs, where there is a rule of law and a certain certainty in the business environment, we are getting also into uh, the, the supply chains that Europe is anchored in, in far further afield places uh, from uh, Russia and Turkey and China and, and rising Africa and the rest. And so this, this is why I think it's fundamentally important. Europe is kind of uh, a network and a gateway for us into uh, the, the broader global economy where the rules of the, the global economy will continue to evolve and change. Um, and uh, it's something we want to be a part of shaping with the partners who share our values as opposed to waiting for others to shape it for us. And so that's, that's the bigger, I think, geostrategic picture that, uh, that underlies the importance of CETA and how we want to make good on CETA and show it to be successful while upholding standards and making sure everyone benefits. Now, you know this uh, because you're here on a Friday afternoon in the middle of March break. What is that? You guys are clearly Euro, Europhiles, Eurowonks here at the Jean Monnet Center. So thank you for your time today, and we're really eager for our discussion. Thank you, Ambassador. Although I should say for university students, it's not March break, so they are supposed to be here. <laughs> it's more for parents, uh, the, the, the challenge. Anyway, uh, so thanks a lot for the presentations. Now we're going to open up the floor for questions. There's going to be a microphone running around, just again for the, the people at home or wherever they are. And so we're going to start, I'm going to start maybe I'll collect some questions. Anybody yes. wants to break the ice? Yep, yeah, please, if you don't mind. You can keep the questions short. Oh, I didn't realize you were going to put it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I put it at the very last, last second. Um, I, I'm part owner of an IT company. We deal with hotels and resorts and primarily in the U.S. and beyond, but we very recently started uh, moving into the European market. And uh, we ran into an issue with regard to uh, uh, servers. I'm not going to get into the details, except my question to Mr. Dion or any of the others is that uh, now that we have this agreement with CETA, is it well known amongst the industry leaders that, in fact, these barriers are not supposed to be in place anymore, or is there often a situation where we've always done it this way, if you're coming here, you're going to operate in our rules, not realizing that the, the way that uh, companies need to operate now in Europe when dealing with Canadians is a little different. So I'm just, I, my question is, are, are, are European companies aware that CETA has changed some of the rules? 
maybe I will. I, I, I think Dan is the best to answer that because he's, it is his bread and butter of every day. But in fact, a, a, a trade agreement may help you in removing the, uh, the tariffs. And, but about uh, regulations, we will have a, a, a committee to study a way to harmonize. But there is no obligation for any uh, government in the EU to adopt the Kenyan regulations. And in fact, to be sure that CETA will be accepted, we needed to repeat that again and again, uh, that it's not an obligation to accept our regulations about uh, meat or about uh, uh, GMO or don't worry, you have still the full right to accept your regulations. The thing they cannot do is to discriminate us. If there is a regulation, they cannot add a regulation only for Canada but with, that will not apply f f for the EU competitors. But then we'll certainly have more to say. May I? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Go okay. Ahead. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We, we, this is top of mind uh, because um, you, I think your question is to see the promotion. And uh, absolutely. Because look, when you make a trade deal, you, you, you liberalize, you, you, you remove obstacles on each side. And I'm, I'm pretty convinced, living in Europe, that the Europeans are aware of it, and they're moving. And that's, uh, that's great for uh, Canadian consumers. We're going to have more choices and probably more competitive markets, lower prices on a lot of things. But it's a lot of competition for uh, Canadian producers, right? So the Europeans are coming here. We've got to get there. And we've got to look for the partnerships where it makes sense together. Because you know, in a trade deal, if you lift barriers on both sides, but only one side uses it, it's not such a good deal for the other side. So we are, we are absolutely uh, preoccupied uh, with this. That's why we're here, even though our day jobs are over there, uh, because we're uh, committed uh, with the, uh, the great work of our trade commissioner colleagues. Where are they all? But wave your hands, I think you should. trade commissioners. Let's do some introductions there. back there. Yeah. Uh, please, uh, no, well. Where's Cindy Eva? I like can't. Well, we'll, we'll do that after. Uh, all, this, all this to say, we're doing. Uh, we're most concerned. I think. I think Canada's big companies know about it for sure, because right? they're in the market already. Uh, they're established. They've got their partnerships. They've been part of the, the the discussion and they've been watching it carefully. We're most concerned about our small and medium-sized businesses. As you know, most of our economy is SMEs and uh, very few export. Um, but many are, are, have great ideas and they're just looking at how to scale up. And, and, and so we feel it's our responsibility to uh, prepare them as best possible, to identify opportunities and to do the kind of matchmaking that's required between our regional offices, like the one right here in Halifax, where we're going to be uh, increasing our support and our, the number of trade commissioners here to, you, you, you should all consider them, not just the, the federal representatives here, but the, the portal into the, yep. the diplomatic network of Canada abroad where each one of our embassies in Europe has a trade team with sectoral priorities and knowledge of the Canadian companies in market and how they've worked and what's succeeded and, and what has failed. And the knowledge of the regulations. Knowledge of all the rules, the regulations, the particular, you know, the, the national, subnational, and how CETA applies. And their jobs out there is to identify the opportunities and to match those opportunities with the what the regional offices here learn about the, the, the expertise locally, the capabilities, and the interest in, in, in getting to Europe, and not just for goods. I should say the big top line story, and I think it's fundamentally important here for seafood and for blueberries and for maple syrup and for fiberboard and on tires and all the other great exports that are going up right now uh, because the tariffs are removed and therefore uh, the, the comparative advantage over other exporters like the US uh, is, is, is clear. It's more than trade, it's investment, it's services, it's labor mobility, it's, it's access to a 3.3 trillion a, a Euro public procurement market. So think of you know architects, engineers, environmental services. We now can bid on those on equal standing with European firms. So we got to get in the game because they can bid on ours too. Yeah. Huh? And that's that's the so so it's it's uh, there are all these different provisions now. Uh, you, you also I think suggested are we how do we know we're keeping our word? Well, that we have 20 separate governance committees to oversee the implementation of CETA and to monitor its implementation. And not just its implementation, that is to say, is each side keeping its word, but to, to troubleshoot, to find where the obstacles are, or the misunderstandings, or the, the complications are arising in the application of the rules, uh, and to make sure that we're, we're not just monitoring, but that we're, we're reviewing and reporting on the results. And for us, that means reporting on 
how are the benefits uh, flowing and where are they flowing and are they being widely shared and if not so, what should we do about it? And, and what about those standards? The first table that, that uh, we, we agreed on the uh, uh, eve of ratification in Europe at the Council, the European Council, to do an early review of the Trade and Sustainable Development chapter to, to review our progress on uh, labor standards in particular, to make sure that we're upholding the standards and that we're, they're nowhere we're being lowered to attract trade and investment under CETA, and that we're going to try and build in um, uh, not just a regular review and publication of results, but some kind of compliance measures. And that's really important. That's part of what this new progressive trade agenda is. So I think uh, on the promotion side, we've got a lot of work to do. We're going to keep at it because we, we have to we have to really get out there. And, and we got to be smart about it, but we got to recognize the opportunities. And, and we're here to help you guys. And, and, uh, and if you know people who are interested in what CETA means, uh, please refer them to us. Have a look at our website where there's lots of great tools, a tariff finder. You put in the product number and it tells you what the tariffs are. So if, if people, are, if customs brokers are charging the tariffs, then they got to get with the new uh, rules because the government of Canada is not charging them anymore, uh, and so on and so on. And so we'll, uh, it's, it, obviously it takes a while to implement these things, but it's been enforced since September. We're seeing good numbers, although we don't have a big macro roll-up yet. We're seeing uh, great anecdotes and success stories. I can tell you from uh, d talking to the Port of Halifax today, to some of the seafood folks, to you know, a whole bunch of, uh, of others, um, there's a lot of promise here. We've got to make good on the promise, not just for Canadian prosperity and jobs and growth here, uh, but to show uh, our critics, the critics of globalization, that open trade, open markets can work and it can be done in a way that doesn't lower standards and that, in fact, can be uh, for the benefit of all. Thank you. Please. Thanks. Yep. Jordan? Yeah, no, go ahead. Oh, good Um, I was just wondering, I know one of the cornerstones of CETA um, is the new procurement policies, and I was wondering if you could speak to the, the, the importance or the significance of these new policies and what they mean for, for Canada. Um, I know some people, some critics would be worried about um, massive inflow of foreign capital and how that affects the Canadian economy, sometimes negatively. Um, so I was just wondering if, if you could speak to that, potentially. I'm happy to. I'll, I'll let you go. All right. Okay. Yeah, then I'll well, um, the, the procurement chapter, it's, it's a, a government contracts, right? Uh, at all levels, not just uh, uh, European level, member state level, even sub-national level, even, I, I think, to a degree municipal, but there are, there are ceilings on it. It's not every, every uh, I, I, it's under certain, uh, o only over certain limits, but they're, they were pushed down on purpose. And, and if you look at the size of that market, uh, it's you know, over 500 million consumers in Europe for, for export, but when it comes to government contracts, last year, uh, I think on, on the last several years, it's been around 3.3 trillion euros. That's a lot of money. And we've got real expertise in Canada. So uh, we, it's true, we're opening up our public, our government procurement markets, and Europeans can now compete for our tenders, but we can compete for a much bigger, bigger pie, right? And so uh, now they're good, they're skilled, but, but we've got skilled expertise uh, you know, in dredging, in, in environmental services, engineering services, areas that there's expertise right here, coastal communities like this one that have uh, ports and, and uh, all kinds of, of expertise that, um, again, hard decisions about where, where you don't want to be and how you scale up if you want to go to Europe. But we, uh, that was a real win for us, I think, in opening up uh, that massive market and having an advantage that no other competitor has. Now, on capital coming into Canada, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, it was a real interest of ours to bring in uh, European investors because we think there are a lot of uh, Canadian firms that have really great ideas and they've been providing local products and services, but they don't have the, the, the money, the capital to grow fast enough and go elsewhere. And they're either going to get bought out by some other big firm offshore or they're gonna, someone's going to copy their idea and they're going to be out of the market. Whereas if we can partner with European investors in things like clean technologies, renewable energy, some of these growth sectors of the future, I think we're natural partners because we share priorities. We, we share, uh, again, the, the, the framework of values. And uh, the rules on investment are clear. I mean, there, there's, there, there are obviously, um, we, if you want to talk about investment dispute settlement, we can. That was one of the more contentious uh, parts of it, and we uh, we made significant changes to the uh, the system that existed previously, or that actually still exists until all the member states ratify 
that because investment protection is a mixed, one of the very few items in CETA that was a mixed competency. Therefore, it's not yet enforced. I, I said that uh, the, the, the exports, Canadian exports to the EU is okay, but potential to be much better. But about direct investments is quite good. Uh, Canada's investment in, in, uh, in the EU is $235 billion, and the EU investments in Canada is $250 billion. Uh, and the UK is the s second foreign uh, employer in Canada. Of course, the first is the US by far, but the UK is second, and France is third, and Germany is, go is going up. So I, with CETA, we have an opportunity to have more of this. And as Dan said, um, it, it's usually it's very good investments. It's about uh, partnership on uh, high tech, clean tech. Um, and um, so it's certainly something we need to, to encourage and uh, to protect NAFTA as much as possible. Because when they come here, they want to have access to the US market. And now that we have negotiated a, a trade agreement with, with a, a lot of Asian countries, including Japan, uh, they, they will see a window toward, toward Asia. So Canada will be well positioned uh, to attract strong investments from the EU. Okay. I might just add one oh. comment. I was a little bit surprised, actually, by your concern about uh, European money coming in. You're absolutely right, Ambassador Neil. You know, it's a, it's a really good balance, and, and that's kind of strange, actually. We should have much more European money in Canada, given the larger size of the market. Your concern might reflect, and I'm just reading into it, that you're thinking that they're just buying out Canadians. I think in most cases they're actually making new investments, and that's what's really important, bringing new technology, new innovation, and most importantly, creating new jobs. If I may just add on that, if we miss the European market, I think we'll not be in a good situation to win the other markets, uh, because it's the best way to be sure that we'll have the best technologies, uh, the best know-how. Uh, and, and, uh, and if we ignore that, if we have the attitude to try to stay in isolation, we'll become less and less competitive in the world. So no, we need to take uh, the opportunity of CETA. Uh, uh, last word, uh, and, and uh, <laughs> investment to research, because it's, it's a similar, yeah. I mean, the partnerships, uh, like Europe is the biggest public spender in R&D, their, their budget, uh, I was saying in our last meeting, 80 billion euros over a six-year uh, financial framework, they still have, the next two years, they've got to spend 30 billion of those euros on research partnerships. That's a lot of money. We don't spend anywhere near that much money. We're just smaller. And so for us to be able to partner with them in those areas is fantastic, and especially on, on areas that are not, uh, that, that will see commercialization and the creation of jobs. So I think, I think there's every advantage there. Thank you. Uh, each of you in your comments have mentioned the importance of ports and shipping, marine shipping. It sounds like you met with the Halifax Port Authority. <laughs> so I have a few questions related. I'm interested to hear how can Nova Scotia and other Atlantic provinces prepare themselves in terms of the environmental concerns, the security implications, the you know physical infrastructure needed in order to um, advance or, or augment our trade with the European Union? Um, they, I think our former Minister of Environment. Yeah, they, <laughs> they gave us the le petit ivre blanc. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's impressive what uh, your province is doing uh, in order to, uh, to be a leader in the world for a, a new source of energy and uh, especially um, protection of oceans. I, I insist on that because Prime Minister Trudeau decided to make uh, Oceans one of the teams of the G7 that will be in Charlevoix, not so far away from here. And, and uh, uh, Oceans account for 15% of the provincial GDP. Dalhousie, Dalhousie University has 25% of all federal natural science and engineering research council in Canada. Um, you have the, the tidal source of energy that is well developed here. Uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are removed because you are trying to move out of coal and going to, uh, to hydro and, and, uh, and wind. Um, so uh, I think there is a, a lot of um, reasons why uh, Nova Scotia is interested to be a strong partner with Europe about uh, the, the issues of oceans, the environment, 
and the fight against climate change. And my colleagues may, would like to add something. The, the, it's key. I mean, if you want to be, remain competitive going forward, you're exactly right. You have to be looking at the environmental and climate change aspects of all operations. And I, I don't know, we, we're just in this one day that we've been here, I think we're really reassured that uh, not only does the, uh, the academic world and the innovation hubs that you have here understand that, but the private sector understands that good business is clean business. And that if they're going to be able to maintain this market uh, with the European Union, uh, it isn't just the standards that are written on the paper, but the fact that we have to be ahead of the game, uh, well, very much so. On that, um, the main, one of the main resistance to, to uh, this kind of agreements, trade agreements, uh, is the environmental concern. Uh, and it's certainly the case in Germany, where I am, but it's also the case in France and many countries. The concern that a, tr a free trade agreement or open trade agreement will be a race to the bottom. In order to be competitive, we'll need to um, weaken our regulations in order to be competitive with the other guy who is not respecting the same rules than us. That, that's the main argument. And it's why in 2015, uh, when you had a change of government in Canada, um, the negotiations were a bit um, difficult with, with, with the EU uh, on many files, but especially this one, the environment. And, and so it was necessary to beef up, to strengthen uh, the chapters on the environment and sustainability in CETA to make sure that everybody will agree that it's not a race to the bottom, it's the opposite. It's an opportunity to make sure that if there is an innovation coming here in Dartmouth or in, or in uh, Halifax, it will reach, reach Dusseldorf and, and it will reach uh, Berlin as speedily as possible and the other way around. If you, trade is part of the our ability to spread the best technologies, the best know-how to help humankind to reconcile ourselves with the planet. And if I, but, and I add okay. to that too, just to say, um, I think your question had, had, I heard two parts, not just how to prepare for the, 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 the concerns on environment and, and, and environmental security, um, but also how to take advantage of the trade deal um, here in this region, given the port and the assets you have. And so I'll tell you what I told several today, which is that, uh, like, yes, the tariffs, and, and uh, yes, Europeans want more lobster and more scallops and more, more shrimp, and, and, and that's great. But beyond the tariffs, you know, uh, we, we got to look further into the benefits here. And that's when I look at, at the advantages of this region. It's it really kind of mind-blowing. Uh, we have such a good brand, Canada in, in Europe, and, and Nova Scotia and this region, uh, that all we got to do is get people here. And if we can get people here, they're coming back, right? Because it's the, the, the quality of life and the advantages here in terms of cost, in terms of... So, so I think what we... That's why I really think uh, the, the expanding air links, the, the emphasis on, um, on uh, higher education, education promotion, and on research partnerships, uh, 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 certainly on areas like oceans where there's a real expertise here and some cutting edge work, that's going to bring Europeans in here and they're going to stay. Or if they don't stay, they're going to come back and forth. They're going to, it's, it's going to, uh, going to create uh, uh, lots of new innovation and, and opportunity, economic opportunity. And, uh, and I think it'll, it'll really um, uh, sort of seize the benefits for the next generation uh, emerging sectors. I think that's... Yep, please stand back. Yep, go ahead. Uh, one second. Um, the three of you put an importance on the seafood trade between Europe and specifically Atlantic Canada. Um, there's been studies shown that the seafood market's going down because of the lack of fish being produced and how much we're eating. Do you have any predictions on what could happen if the lack of seafood becomes prominent in distribution between trades? And if you do have those predictions, what do you... Do you also have ways that you plan on fixing them, or, yeah? Uh, no, we, we have this concern, uh, of course. You see, uh, uh, your, your port is exporting to 52% to Asia, 37% to, to uh, Europe. So if we assume that CETA is an opportunity to increase the trade with Europe, uh, what that means for the fish stock and the uh, lobster stock. 
Well, we asked this question to every of the um, uh, officials we met today, and the concern is very strong, and they, it's not a concern, it's a responsibility. They, they, they told us that they are looking the stock very, very carefully, because it's, they know it's the future of the province. So uh, in order to fish, uh, to sell today, if you jeopardize the ability to sell tomorrow, it's not a way to be responsible. Uh, you are electing uh, politicians, make sure that they are responsible uh, because it's your future. And so to boost the, uh, their chance of re-election today at the expense of the ability to protect the fish stock or the uh, lobster stock for tomorrow would be a big mistake, but it's not my, my sense. I met your premier, I met your uh, deputy ministers, the port authorities, and everybody is very aware of the need to protect the stock in order to protect the future of the province. There's another, sorry, over there. Claire? Um, so listed under the government uh, website, uh, as one of your key sectors um, is oil and gas, which is largely an industry that is um, leading to a negative impact on our uh, climate change. And uh, so CETA plans to uh, almost like, um, li limit or put um, the tariffs of oil and glass, gas to um, 0%. Um, does that not make it contradictory to your claims that you want CETA to um, mitigate climate change in the over in the long term? Our, our civilization has been built on the um, uh, hydrocarbon, uh, uh, to, uh, on oil, gas, and coal. Uh, I'm speaking about the industrialization. It started with that. Today we see that if we continue this way, we'll destroy our relationship with the planet because we'll have greenhouse gas emissions that will warm the planet at the point we, where life on the planet will be more difficult to sustain. So that's the challenge we have. But 75% uh, of our uh, energy is coming from oil, gas, and coal as I speak. We need to, re to replace that. It cannot, be, it cannot happen overnight. But we need to go to this direction. And I may tell you, I am in the country that is building one out of five cars in the world, Germany. And their plan is to go out of diesel as soon as possible. They disagree between themselves how speedily it's possible, but it is their plan. And if a company is not doing it, this company is putting at risk its future because the regulations will become more and more difficult for diesel and for petroleum, and more and more it will be necessary for humankind to find a way to transport yourself through electricity uh, and green technologies. So it's why we need to go to this direction. The way to do it is, there are many ways, but one way is to put the price on carbon. As long as it is, it is free, it's very difficult to make progress. So I, I'm very pleased that in our country, uh, we have an agreement between the federal government and now uh, 12 out of 13 provincial and territories uh, to have a price on carbon in Canada that will be significant enough to speed up the change to, uh, step by step outside of a carbon economy. And if I may make the, the point about CETA again, I think we need to do it with the Europeans. They have a lot of good technologies that will help us and we have a lot of ideas that will help them, and trade is part of the solution. Kathy, John has a question, do you? Um, well, sort of to build on the pr uh, previous question, um, there is a lot of interest in oil and gas uh, in Nova Scotia recently, especially with large investments made by the province to explore and exploit the liquid natural gas and oil reserves off of Nova Scotia, um, of which there seem to be a significant amount. Um, as part of CETA, is there an intent to use these oil and natural gas reserves that can be exported cheaply to Europe as a way to offset Europe's dependence on um, more difficult to work with partners for heating and electricity? 
Of course, if you have a strong business case, if you are able to say to the Europeans, my natural gas will be less costly, more secure, uh, more sustainable, and then the one of Russia, for instance, uh, you will win your point. But if you don't have a strong business case, you're just saying, I'm a, I'm a nice man, and the other guy is ugly, don't buy his natural gas, buy mine. I'm afraid it will not be enough to convince. But there is certainly a strong interest to diversify their source of, of uh, energy. Uh, and so if Canada is able to be competitive on, on the European market, uh, certainly the fact that we have a like-minded country, a very acceptable, uh, acceptable democracy, uh, will uh, make them very interested to work with us as long as we are competitive on the market. Okay, we have a question here. Five more minutes, so we're going to collect two or three more questions after this one. Uh, my question is in regards to the investment court system. Uh, much of the resistance to international trade agreements is found in the arbitration processes that allow investors to sue states for loss of profits uh, due to regulation. What protections, are, if any, are in place to prevent this loss of the right to regulate? I had this discussion for a long time. The, yeah. the, the investment court system is the new model in CETA, which is not yet in force because it's, as part of a mixed competency, it's one of the uh, very few uh, measures in CETA that cannot be put into force until all 28 member states have, have approved. And that may take a while, frankly, given the court reference and everything else. But you will recall that the old model was the, based on, on uh, the, the appointment of uh, arbitrators by the, the, the interested parties. The new model is publicly appointed members of a tribunal with transparent functioning and an appeal process. And it'll have a, a code of ethics so that um, what, what the members of the tribunal uh, are, are uh, able to do in terms of their private practice will be uh, restricted. And uh, loss of profit will not be a grounds. Uh, it's explicit. It's in the joint interpretive instrument that uh, was uh, uh, signed by Canada and the EU on the eve of the Council. Uh, approval process where uh, it was it was reiterated in there that this is explicitly noted as this is not the right of the state to regulate in the public interest for high standards and for quality public services is in no way constrained and loss of profit is not an adequate grounds for launching a, a claim under under this new system. Okay, so quite a few, but I want to don't mind leave the students to conclude. So we have one. Yeah, one more question. Let's let's make it. If it's brief, we can do two. Okay, please. Right. Um, yeah, let's take both of them. If you don't mind, one yeah. and then second one. That's a good idea. Thanks. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, with the UK being uh, the most utilized European market uh, that we trade with, um, how will the Brexit or vote affect um, the potential of CETA? Good question. Yeah, it's a good one. And then over here. Oh, sorry, down here. Hi, this is more of a, a policy cr uh, question than a trade question, but all three of you touched on the rise in populism in Europe, and given that uh, Italy just had their election with a few populist parties um, earning seats, so how do, you, how do you foresee that's going to impact trade relations or just uh, political relations in general between Canada and Italy? It's actually well connected with Brexit, so please. I'll, I'll let you speak to Brexit, they'll speak to the populism. Right? I want to speak to populism as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, why, why we don't each of us answer okay. the two questions? Yeah, yeah. Let's conclude uh, with that. Uh, I won't speak as much to, to Brexit. Let me speak to uh, populism because of the recent Italian elections. I'm sure you may have watched them. I think anybody who was listening uh, wasn't really that surprised at the outcome. There were a lot of people who were not listening and were just hoping for the best, uh, the best being um, you know, some sort of a coalition between the centre-right and the centre-left. Uh, instead, what you saw, and I thought the fact that you did it in plural is exactly right, uh, two rather populist parties. Uh, I don't know if you can actually, one is definitely centre-right, right, and another one is not, it's not quite clear what the uh, five-star movement is. It's a you know, conglomeration of everybody who's unhappy. 
It is an anti-party. Uh, it is anti-globalist. It is uh, uh, pro. Well, maybe it is pro-protectionist, uh, but it is certainly uh, anti-establishment. But the fundamental, and it's not unique to Italy, we've been seeing it across Europe, and I would say we've probably seen it in the South, um, and you know, to a certain extent here, uh, it is a movement against established parties. It is a movement, particularly by young people who are upset that their concerns do not seem to be addressed. Uh, it, unemployment remains high in Europe. You know, the actual statistics in a country like Italy says 13 percent, but it's more like 40 or even higher amongst youth, 180,000 Italian young people leaving that country every year because they're not able to get a job. That is a fundamental problem. So that's one of the issues. The other issue is migration. Uh, the, uh, the rise of populism, particularly in a, what I call a frontline state like Italy, has unfortunately uh, been accelerated by the perceived, and I'll say perceived, but it is nevertheless just as, as real, the perceived threat to their security because they cannot control the migration coming into their country. The threat is either is physical to some people, just the presence of all these uh, unknown people, and the other is the threat to, to jobs and, and uh, longer term security. <coughs> what does that do to our relationship? Well, it's going to make my job a lot more interesting. Uh, Italy, we felt, was a lot more like-minded in the past few years uh, under the Democratic Party. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. That's what diplomacy is all about. You've got to look underneath what protectionism is all about. So if it's about jobs, I'm going to tell them about jobs, and I'm going to tell them that this agreement is going to bring more jobs and more opportunities. It's going to be more labor mobility. It's going to be more opportunity, more innovation, more partnership. And if we're going to talk about migration, I'm going to tell them about the success we've had in Canada because we've had managed migration. So we do have to address that, that very basic issue right now that they're facing of uncontrolled. But after that, the dialogue gets really interesting, and that's about our process of integration and the mobility that we allow for people that they can move very, very quickly. And they're very interested, actually, in our models. We're already having that discussion. Just this week, we hosted the uh, WUSC, uh, the World University Services, because they have a wonderful program, I don't know if they've been doing it here, where they're working with refugee uh, students to help them integrate into the student body. Because of the practice that we've had back here in Canada, we're taking that to Italy, we took it to Malta as well. So, so I'm fairly optimistic, as long as we can get out of the stereotypes, the dialogue of populism and anti, and get into the fundamental issues that we can still find common cause. Brexit? Uh, in two minutes? <laughs> I, I, I would take the two, too, but if you want to okay. okay. No, no, I, I feel well, I want to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, I think uh, Alex uh, facilitated my, my task because she said a lot of the things I wanted to say. The Brexit for Canada, we have three priorities. The first one is to be sure that CETA and the strategic agreement will not be trapped in these tricky negotiations, and Dan is making sure it, there is a étanche. Uh, uh, protection against any, any, uh, any of that. The second one is, will be to keep strong relationship with the UK, whatever happens, or historic relations with the UK so strong, there's no way it will, be, uh, it will not be a strong relationship with Canada and the UK. And the third point is to make sure that we'll strengthen our relationship with the EU, including about trade, uh, because uh, part of the reasons why 40% of our trade is with the UK today is because the UK is perceived as a window toward the EU. Hmm? Uh, because they speak English, because we have strong relationship with them, We've, we felt our, our business community felt easier to go to the UK in order to reach uh, Italy, Germany, uh, and the, the Netherlands, and now Poland and, and all the East Europe. Uh, it will be more difficult than now uh, because of Brexit, whatever Brexit means, because we don't, still don't know what kind of uh, solution they will find in their relationship between the EU and, and the UK if there is a Brexit at the end of the day. Because for now, it has mean, been much more a uh, debate within the UK than between the UK and the EU. The uh, UK is very divided about that. And uh, it's complicate, complicating a lot of the negotiation with the EU. But in the meantime, we protect our interest, and we hope that our two friends, the UK and the EU, will find a, a solution. About um, populism, uh, yes, fully agree. Let, let me say that in my own way. Um, 
because populism is a dangerous word. It seems to me it's almost a positive one. Uh, the, the leader of the League uh, <coughs> in Italy uh, said, I'm proud to be populist because I'm, pr I'm, I, I'm close to the people and I love the people. I'm ne uh, I am part of them. So call me a populist. I like it. So, so um, we need to, to define what we mean by that. And the de definition I would suggest, it's not only me, it's a large number of, of, uh, of uh, authors who propose it, is it's when uh, someone or, or party is saying, uh, I will concentrate the powers in my hands on behalf of the people against the elite, and for that I will weaken the institutions that may be an obstacle to this concentration of powers. So it's an attack against not democracy alone, it's an attack on liberal democracy. That means a democracy where the government is limited to protect the, 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 the rights of individuals. The government cannot do everything because you have an independent uh, judiciary, uh, uh, non-political public service, parliamentary rules, uh, freedom of the press, uh, you, we have charter of rights, and so on. No, no, no. I don't want that anymore uh, that stop my power because I am the people. That's the populist. So you have different kinds of reasons why people may be seduced by this kind of way to see the world. And I think uh, Alex mentioned them. I would list that in this way. I see th three main reasons. The first one is the sense that the growth does not, the economic growth does not benefit to you, but to, one, to the 1% or 0.1%. So if a, if a strong leader raised one day and said, enough of that, I will protect the little guy against the big guy because I'm too a big guy and I know them. And it, you see what I mean? This may work if you have the sense of unfairness in the society, uh, then you have a society vulnerable to a populist, populist appeal. Uh, that, and that, I would say, is the leftist populism, like uh, Podemos in, in Spain or Five Stars, yes, in, in, in Italy. But the most prominent one is the extreme right-wing xenophobic populism. And this comes with the sense that the people is under attack by foreigners. And for, they, are, they are the foreigners that we are accustomed with, and the new ones, which are the Muslim, the Muslims, the fear of the Muslims, because this immigration coming in Europe is almost only Muslim. And uh, the Muslim is, is a fear because it's connected with extreme um, is, Islamism. So people don't understand that the first victims of extreme Islamism is the Muslim populations. And most politicians, when they are responsible, like the, the, the government we have in Canada, is always very, very careful to explain that, yes, we have a problem with extreme Islamism, but Muslims are with us. It's not a fight between two civilization, civilizations. It's a fight for human civilizations against terrorism. But in Europe and elsewhere, populists will use it uh, as a way to become popular. Uh, and you have seen what the kind of po political campaign you have in some countries of East Germany, East Europe now. And in, in, in Germany, uh, one voters out of eight voted of, of a party of this kind. So that's the second reason. And the third reason, and I don't see that in the literature enough, but I'm sure it's there, is what I, we were speaking just before. The fear that is created by the obligation to get out, to, to get out of the oil and gas civilization. A lot of interests are linked with that, and to switch to something else creates a lot of anxiety that the populist will use. All this is an invention by a cosmopolitan disconnected elite. Climate change does not exist. Vote for me, I will protect your factory, I will protect your job. And populists are using that big time. And most of the time, when they win somewhere, they kill the climate change policies uh, that uh, we try to, to, to build. So I think these are the three reasons why you have a populist trend in, in the world, uh, and uh, it's a challenge for liberal democracies, and it's an additional reason why we need to have a strong diplomatic and political approach of Europe. We need to make sure that Europe will remain a strong liberal democratic world in order to help Canada
to, stray, uh, to stay a strong liberal democracy. Would you mind to wrap it up here? Or? I thought okay. you could end on Yeah, here. let's end it like that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So thanks everybody for coming here. Of course, thanks for the, the speakers today. They provide a great you know, overview of the relationship between Canada and the EU. They promised to stick around for a few minutes. I know we ran a, a bit out of time, but if it's okay, some of the students might come, here, come up here. and. Uh